Hello everyone and welcome back once again for another Moment in the Word. My name's Chris and you're here with Lights and Perfection Incorporated, where we bring the truth about biblical perfection and holiness to light through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let's open up with a quick word of prayer and invite the Lord and invite the power of His goodness and His presence by the Holy Spirit into this session. Lord Jesus, we do adore you. We thank you for your forgiveness. We ask and we seek and we pray that you would clear us of any guilt and shame and evil deeds, Lord, and that you would prepare us to be a pure and spotless, blameless bride of yours so that the day you return, you can receive us to yourself and we can enter in to the wedding feast, the wedding supper of the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We thank you for your word and we ask, Lord, that you would just open up our eyes and our ears to hear what you're saying. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Today, I want to talk about psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, but more importantly, the peace of Christ and the word of Christ that can dwell in us richly. To that, I want to say Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 16 give an amazing uh, glimpse into true Christian fellowship, I, I'll say. But let's go ahead and just read that. Again, that's Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 16. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, there's a lot in there. And to start with, I want to talk about this, this, these two things, letting the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and also letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's kind of like a, a cause and effect, if you will. The cause being the peace of Christ and the word of Christ dwelling in you richly and ruling in your hearts. The effect is what is mentioned later when Paul says, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So the cause is the peace of Christ ruling in your hearts and the, the, the word of Christ dwelling in your hearts richly. When these things are active in the believer's lives, naturally, well, supernaturally, you will be empowered to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. But I want to talk about really quick the, the people that Paul wrote this to because, you know, we see this idea of teaching as exclusive to just the pastor or uh, the preaching minister, and it's exclusive to just those that are running parachurch ministries. But here, the book of Colossians was actually written, and I'm going to read Colossians 1 verse 2 because it says, to whom it was written, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. It wasn't to the elders, it wasn't to the leaders, it was just to the saints. And so everybody in the church, the leaders all the way down to the congregation members, and they were all commended to let the peace of Christ rule in their hearts, to let the word of Christ dwell in them richly, so that as the cause, the effect could be to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So again, the cause and effect come in, but this is applying to all believers in Christ, and I just want to make that clear. Notice, because it was not just a letter to pastors, we have to understand what we see as Christianity today is not necessarily what Paul was preaching into in his day. Today, many churches, they gather every Saturday or Sunday, and you basically hear one person minister. Now, this would be contrary to what was actually spoken of in the book of Colossians, where all the faithful and brethren in Christ were able to teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And this is really important because I want to touch on true Christian biblical fellowship. And the question is here, uh, not necessarily a question, let me read this statement. It said, Notice this, this letter was not just to pastors, but to the saints and faithful brothers. In short, this was written to all Christians, as I already clarified. And I said, we have gotten so used to having services at church all evolving really around one person who teaches. Yet, 
is that real fellowship as described in the Bible? So that's the question. Is that real fellowship as described in the Bible? Now, when I say this, let me clarify, I am not putting down the office of pastor, teacher, or preacher, or how things are set up. I'm simply trying to clarify biblical ideas of Christian fellowship so that maybe we can learn to integrate what the Bible teaches about fellowship into our already structured services so as to allow for the Holy Spirit to move more freely in some congregations. And I also want to note that this is not a message to, as a blanket clause, to every single church. Because some churches allow for the gifting and the fruit of the Spirit to flow freely, while others have a strict, regimented structure that they follow week after week. Again, we're, we're trying to look at the Scripture and not so much all these other churches. Now, we want to be those that occupy, the, occupy our minds and hearts and souls with the Word of God so that it can dwell in us richly and allow the peace of Christ to rule our hearts so that we can be those that teach and admonish one another. Now, Let's go a little bit further. I just simply want to bring the church to another degree of glory and growth because none of us have attained anything. And so what we need to understand is, is growth and maturity in Christ. And that is our aim here at Lights and Perfection, to encourage the saints and the faithful brethren, but also to encourage church leaders in, in the body of Christ to come into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ because that's the office of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. So for this, I want to discuss further the role of the Holy Spirit in the church and how the Holy Spirit works throughout the whole body. And I want to liken this to, and there's an illustration. And so I'm illustrating it based off of the current common structure that we see in churches, that everybody files into church, they hear a couple songs, they pay their tithes, they shake each other's hands, but then they sit for about an hour and hear one person teach week after week. And most churches do that, and I'm not condemning that, but I'm saying there's something so much more beautiful when we allow the Holy Spirit to work through the entire body to produce actual biblical fellowship where people can be edified, exhorted, and actually encouraged to mature in Christ. So the work of the Holy Spirit works throughout the entire body. But what would happen if week after week we put all of our energy onto one part of the body? I want to give you an illustration of a person who has sprained their ankle. You know, when they sprain their ankle, they tend to either hobble on one leg or get crutches to balance themselves out. There's a reason for this. If you have a serious injury on one of your feet, you're going to have a tendency to lean all of your energy onto the other foot. This could be a dangerous thing. It could cause irreparable damage to that other leg. And also, psychologically, it could promote a, a interdependence upon that one leg in the future, even after that limb has been healed. And so, let's understand this, that we were made with the two legs. Now, I'm not trying to shame anybody that may have one leg, but even the person usually with one leg usually has a system in place i.e. a, a um, synthetic leg in place of the old one so that they could have better balance. Because when you're off balance, it doesn't just affect that other leg that you're leaning on, it affects other parts of your body, your spine, your back muscles. And I want to use this illustration to show you how the whole body, when it comes together, and all of its joints and ligaments, it, it expresses itself in love and encourages those joints and ligaments to be strengthened and encourage and growth towards Christ Jesus. And so Paul used the illustration of the body here in Colossians, but also in the book of Corinthians where it talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now track with me here because this is really important information. There are many members but one body, and Jesus Christ is always the head of that body. But if we say to the hand, I have no need of you, or to the foot, I have no need of you, then would you do that to your natural body? Would you say, you know what, hand, I'm just not going to use you anymore because I don't like what you produce for the rest of the body. Now, we know that there is major implications for amputees, for example. They still have things called like ghost pains where it feels like their limb is still there, but it's not, and it's not adding to the rest of the body. And there is irreparable damage that is done to a person that has been amputeed because they rely so heavily on another part of their body. 
give you an example. I had a friend and we used to call him back in the day, we used to call him wheels because he was in a wheelchair from birth. I mean, well, not literally put from birth into a wheelchair, but he was born paralyzed. And later on in life, he was put into a wheelchair. The man accomplished a lot of great things. And it's really amazing to watch this person and how he, he had a car where he had on the steering wheel, he had uh, buttons for the brake and for the gas. And he managed to get along in life very well, but there were things lacking in his life and he openly admitted that. There were things that he could not do because of this paralyzed, uh, because his lower half of his body was paralyzed. However, he made it and he got along, but he had a diminished life in that he couldn't do things that other people could do. Now, we're not shaming or condemning anybody that has those things and we, we praise God that God gives them the strength to get up and still move and do things. And there's amazing um, other people that have testimonies in Christ where they have lost all their limbs and are still going out and doing the work of Christ. And so they're not hindered from doing the work of Christ, but I'm trying to use this illustration to illustrate the importance of having all of your body parts working in working order. If I start walking with a limp in one leg, it's going to affect my spine. And when my spine is affected, at some point in time, I could have neurological damage down the road. Now, I share all that again to bring the contrast and comparison right home to the body of Christ. And Paul himself likens the church to a body that has many members. And so if week after week I go and just lean all of my effort on the one person, first of all, it's going to wear that one person out. And chances are the rest of the body is not going to be edified because all the gifts are not in operation. And so this message is an encouragement to the saints and the faithful brethren, but also the leaders of those congregations and the faithful brethren to incorporate the Holy Spirit to move freely in their church services and in their daily life. Praise the Lord. So, I want to repeat again that this is for all Christians, that all Christians can teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But what is a psalm and a hymn and a spiritual song? Is it that book that's underneath your pew? Is that book that it's, it's in, the, in the back of the chair in front of you in church? No, it, that, that is a psalm and a hymn book, but that's not entirely what it is. And how about the psalms in the book of the Bible? Is that what Paul is talking about here? Well, yes and no. Um, more so, no. You have to understand the heart of the Psalms. The Psalms are filled with people that, that spoke in, in deep distress and in troubles and in difficulties in their life. And they spoke prayers to God and they said, you know, this poor man cried to the Lord and the Lord heard and delivered him out of all his troubles. Brothers and sisters, that's a Psalm in and of itself. But more importantly, it's a testimony of how God moved in that person's life. And so Psalms and hymns, are, are the works, the mighty works of God on display for all to see. And it's not just what is written in the Bible, but it's about what is written in the Bible coming to life in your life and you having the opportunity to share those things that God is doing in your life. That is fellowship. That is where the body of Christ comes together and edifies one another. When one part of the body, let's say the hand, recognizes a cut on the, on the, le on the leg, it rushes to heal that cut. But that cut can't be healed if it's not exposed and given the proper attention in the church. So it is, brothers and sisters, many of us shuffle in week after week and leave unedified because maybe there was a gift in someone else that we needed to hear from. Maybe if there was a platform for the whole body of Christ to come together and share what God is doing in their life, people would mature faster in Christ. I share a quick testimony about my life. I have gained so much more and I'm so thankful for the, the men and the women of God that people, that, that the people of God that, that were placed into my life by God himself at various times and in different seasons of my life who didn't know what I was going through and it happened in services and out of services and in just daily life at work where people of God came into my life and they just simply shared testimony about how God was working in their life. And unbeknownst to them, God had been trying to work that in my life as well. And so when they shared that by the Holy Spirit, it gave me edification, encouragement, and exhortation, and it brought me to new levels of maturity, more than just your occasional Bible teaching. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God needs to be allowed back into his churches. 
He needs to be allowed the free reign that he desires to work through his people, the entire body of Christ. And again, I am not saying let's get rid of the teaching minister. We need our pastors and our teachers, but we need our pastors and our teachers to recognize that the whole body needs to participate. Now, what does it mean by participate? I am not, I am not by any means saying that it's all about the greeter, the person who receives and counts the tithes, the person who's singing the songs, the person who is shake, you know, introducing people to one another. That is not the gifting that God had in mind here. We're talking about the peace of Christ ruling in your hearts, brothers and sisters. We're talking about the word of Christ dwelling in your hearts, brothers and sisters. And in, in, in effect, that's the cause, the effect is that you will teach and admonish one another. That means the entire body can teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The things that God is doing in their lives, they can express to other people. But again, if we only lean heavily on one member of the body, then what becomes of the rest of the body? Well, it could be affected just like that person that had to walk and lean on that one leg. It could affect the muscles in the back. It could affect the spine. It could affect neurology. It could affect many things. But the importance is that we don't allow that to take place, but we allow God to move in his church once again. Brothers and sisters, I hope this message has been an encouragement for you. And I hope it has edified you and brought you to a new level of glory and maturity in our Lord Jesus Christ. I just like to say, as always, the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you, that he be gracious unto you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we love you. God bless you.